Hi everyone and welcome back to the George Collection. This is episode number 28. I'm excited to bring to you the December 1997 issue with Kevin Costner on the front. In particular, a very short article about the Titanic of all things. If you remember correctly, this is when the movie Titanic came out. And for the record, I hate sad movies. I saw this movie and I was just distraught. There was room on that door for Jack, okay? There was a lot of room left on that door, and I think all of you can agree with me on that. That's not a conspiracy theory. There was plenty of room for him on that door. Okay, back to George Magazine. This is called Lessons from the Deep. The sinking of the Titanic is more than just an epic tragedy in this month's blockbuster topic. Here's the political fallout from the loss of the ocean liner. The disaster sparked more government regulation. The Titanic's first designer, Alexander Carlyle, wanted to install 64 lifeboats, more than enough for all passengers and crew members. But ultimately, only 16 lifeboats ended up on board, more than laws then required. After the fiasco, governments worldwide adopted safety regulations mandating lifeboat seating for everyone, as well as evacuation drills to plan for a catastrophe. As the Titanic entered the North Atlantic ice fields, radio operators did not convey iceberg warnings to the ship. After the collision, rescue flares were spotted by another vessel, but were mistaken for shipboard fireworks. In the tragedy's wake, 24-hour radio watches and better lookout systems became the norm. Next, public grief set off anti-capitalist agitation. Within days of the sinking, Senator William Alden Smith of Michigan, a fierce opponent of Titanic investor J.P. Morgan, convened a hearing. The senator saw the disaster as a direct result of corporate greed and elitist luxury. We're running mad with the lust of wealth and of power and of ambition, Smith said. We are separating society into castes. It takes a terrible warning to bring us back to our moorings and our senses. Labor leaders claimed that Morgan had fattened his pockets from the conditions that made inevitable this feast of death. Next, shipboard segregation provoked outrage. African Americans were largely excluded from the Titanic's maiden voyage. Consequently, some blacks later found morbid amusement in the sinking. A popular underground poem known as the Titanic Toast tells of a mythical black stoker who jumps overboard and swims to shore while the men and women who are left behind ply him with offers of money and sex. And last, the old guard used the tragedy to snipe at suffragists. Attempts to save women and children first were used against those demanding voting rights for women. In Washington, D.C., a group of women defending their gender's traditional roles soon dedicated a memorial to the chivalry of American manhood, with First Lady Helen Taft donating the first dollar. If women would let men die for them, their argument went, then they should let men vote for them. The reason I wanted to highlight that article was because of other tragedies and what happens in the wake of those tragedies. I will let you guess which ones I'm talking about, really any of them. They all lead to more regulation, they all lead to anti-capitalism, and they all lead to just fear and more control. These types of tragedies have been exploited for a very long time. There are a lot of conspiracies out there surrounding the Titanic and other tragedies. I watched a documentary called Titanic, The Shocking Truth, and it offered an incredible theory. And if you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. There's a lot of theories out there. What do you guys think happened? Put it in the comments. But one thing I think we can all agree on is that the door was big enough for Jack. There's no question. I hope you all enjoyed this episode of The George Collection. Have a great week, and I'll see you next time. George, which is a hoot of a magazine. I thought you were a lawyer. I was. What happened? Well, we uh, we decided. I mean, actually, taking a cue from from folks like yourself and you around the 1992 election, that that there was an opportunity here to uh, change the definition of a political magazine. Uh, certainly, the way Americans were uh, accessing information about politics and politicians was changing. Uh, candidates were appearing on late night talk shows, on talk radio, on sitcoms, uh, and there was a, a kind of a leveling process. And while the rest of media clearly had caught up with that, we felt that political magazines, per se, hadn't. Your mother was a hell of an editor at Doubleday. That's what I hear. Would she have liked George? I think she would have.